existence help explain everyday phenomena? So I want to give you five examples uh, briefly. Uh, the first example is the cloud. Okay, so the cloud, the question arises, um, you have water that's evaporating from all over the place. So it's not only evaporating from just under the cloud, it's also evaporating from here. And the question is, uh, well, how come there's no cloud here or here? How come there's just one here? It appears that the water molecules are somehow evaporating, coming, you might say condensing, but what brings those water aerosol droplets together? Uh, and I'm going to suggest to you in the next few slides that you'd expect them to repel each other, but actually they come together because of the so-called like-likes-like mechanism. They like each other, so they come together. So just to explain that, here is a summary of what I've shown you. If you have a charged particle or molecule in water, um, you have this liquid crystal, easy water around it, negatively charged, and you've got a lot of protons or hydronium ions spread all over. And this is powered by electromagnetic energy. So you won't find this in the textbooks, of course. But anyway, if we take this, uh, just remember this, and suppose we have two particles now instead of one, and suppose they're both negatively charged. Well, a reflexive response is, oh, they're both negatively charged, so therefore they'll repel each other and they'll move in this direction. Um, however, they actually move in this direction. And this is, was, has been shown almost 100 years ago by Irving Langmuir, and then Richard Feynman in his lectures was talking about this, and Feynman, in his own inimitable way, called it like, likes, like. That is, like charges like each other, so they come closer together. In fact, you can find something similar, which comes from the tale of Genji, uh, about warring parties fighting against one another. The only way to bring these parties together is to put something attractive in between. <laughs> <laughs> I'm told this is in the tale of Genji. <laughs> so, so that's what happens here, and, and until recently, you know, Feynman said, like, likes, like, because of an intermediate of unlike charges, and here are the unlike charges bringing them together. And uh, the stability occurs when the attractive force is equal to the repulsive force between the two negatively charged entities. Then they're stable. And if they're stable, if you have a lot of them, then they're going to be in a situation just like this. And this is well observed by many groups over many years. It's called a colloid crystal. And, and it's, it's like if you may have had yogurt this morning, probably the yogurt that you ate had the consistency of, of, of that it has because of these opposite charges that keep the particles basically in balance. And uh, they stick together because of like, likes, like. And I'd like to suggest to you that's what happens in the clouds, that the aerosol droplets all have negative charge, and what's holding them together are the positive charges in between, giving you like, likes, like attraction. And if they're ordered, you can get rainbows uh, out of this. Okay, next point, sandcastles. Well, you know that you can't build sandcastles out of sand. You need sand plus water. So what's going on? How come you, uh, with the water? So what happens is that you see the sand particles up there. Each sand particle, silicon dioxide, builds an exclusion zone right around it, negatively charged, and in between are positive charges. So you have attractive forces because the positive attracts the negative. It brings all those particles together and glues them together so you can build sand castles to protect us against invading flotillas. <laughs> okay, ice. Uh, now, I s we find this all around um, the cosmos, um, and there's a paradox that I, I'd like to start with. I'd like to talk to you about how ice, I believe, ice forms. The, the paradox is that usually, if you want to create order, you have to put energy in. It's like cleaning your room, you know. It's easy for the room to be messy, but it takes energy to restore it to its, uh, it, its uh, ordered state like that. But in the case of ice, it looks like, you know, you put it in the, ref in the freezer, it pulls out energy. So it seems to be the opposite. They're saying, how, how do you get energy withdrawal? It seems to be philosophically or thermodynamically opposite what, what you expect. And um, does ice really violate the general rule? So let's look at how ice might actually form. Um, so this is ice. You saw this before. As I showed you, the ice structure is very closely tied to the EZ structure. There's a slight difference. You just pull out the protons, 
uh, remove the protons from ice, and you get the exclusion zone. So these are very close together. And the implication is, if you want to get, um, get ice, you just have to start with the exclusion zone and re-add the protons. So this is a reversible situation. Um, it looks like the exclusion zone, being so close to the structure of ice, looks like a possible precursor of ice. In other words, the hypothesis is that in order to get to ice, you don't start with bulk water. You go from bulk water to easy water and then to ice because those two structures are very close together. And so it would work something like this. Uh, you start with uh, the easy structure, right? And then you add protons in between those two layers and then the layers uh, undergo a uh, bit of shift, as you see here, and you get ice. So those two are very, very close to one another. And so now the question is, is this hypothesis borne out by evidence? Uh, is, is the easy really necessary for ice formation? And I want to show you that it is. And so this is one of several experiments that we've done uh, to demonstrate that. So you see a cooling plate uh, down at the bottom and a strip of nafion sitting there. And we put a droplet of water right next to the strip of nafion. So everything gets colder and colder. And you see this, the region of view in the next, next slide. So we're getting colder and colder and starting to freeze. And what you see here is that um, here is the piece of nafion and here's the water drop. And this bright region is the first region to freeze. We always get freezing right at this interface, it begins. Now it begins to spread, and you can see it's beginning to spread in this direction. And you can see down here that it's spreading right in the exclusion zone before it actually goes out here. So it looks like the exclusion zone is the first to freeze. In other words, it is the exclusion zone that undergoes the change to ice. So, so the scheme is something like this, where you have an exclusion zone, and next to the exclusion zone are the protons. And they keep building up, you see here. And then what happens is, next step, is they actually rush in uh, to the exclusion zone. And as they rush in, remember, you need protons plus exclusion zone to create ice. And so basically, you have ice formation right here. And the process keeps repeating. And gradually, you build up more ice from the exclusion zone plus protons. So that's the scheme. Now, does this really happen? And here you can see uh, one experiment that we did to demonstrate. This is a chamber, and it's got some microspheres here. And we start cooling uh, this cooling plate. And it turns out that next to the cooling plate, we get a very big EZ here. And we put dye in. And the question is, if we put dye in instead of the microspheres, um, is it true? Do we see a pH change here indicating that there are protons that are, are rushing in? And you can see um, the result here. It shows that this zone that just freezes turns red. Red means a lot of protons in here, as I've shown you before. So it looks as though a lot of protons are rushing in during the time of freezing. Another experiment that shows the same thing. We have a cooling plate here a little uh, dish with water and pH dye. So this means neutral uh, pH. So we're cooling from here. And gradually, this gets colder and colder. And it starts to freeze. It starts to freeze around the edges. And you can see the color around here has gone from the green to this red-orange. And the pH here corresponds to pH 3, huge number of protons. And the same with a, a droplet that's undergoing freezing. So here it's neutral. It gets colder and colder. And you can see the red color during freezing. So it's clear that ice formation absolutely involves protons. And uh, so the ice formation is the exclusion zone plus the protons give you ice. And so I think the energy paradox is actually resolved when you think of this process that's going on. Because you're starting with a, a EZ, which is a liquid crystal. So it's moderately ordered, and the ice is more ordered. Now, so if you need more energy to get more order, you actually get the energy because the charge separation is potential energy. So you're adding this potential energy to get something that's more ordered. So there's no violation um, of, of any thermodynamic principle. Increased order does require energy.
Now, in the reverse case, if you need EZ water to get ice, then if you melt the ice, you should get EZ water. We tested that, and we got exactly that. Melting should produce EZ water. So in a little cuvette, we put some ice, and we gradually let it melt, and we looked at the water that was forming during the melt. And if you remember, EZ water is denoted, is tested by looking at this 270 nanometer absorption. So <coughs> here's what we found in the melting of water, melting ice. There are four graphs, and each one is a different kind of water, deionized, distilled, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll notice that they all have peaks at 270 nanometers. Ordinary water doesn't have that. Okay, so now, um, getting there, almost there, low friction. Why is there friction to start with? Well, friction is caused by asperities that, uh, like mountaintops, and if you shift one by the other, you get friction. If you have two surfaces that look like this, a, a, a bit ragged at the edges, and they're hydrophilic surfaces, and you add water, so you add water. Now, what happens when you add water? Well, you have an exclusion zone here, an exclusion zone here, and positive charges, hydronium ions here. The hydronium ions repel each other. They push the surfaces apart. Therefore, if you shear back and forth, you ought to get very little friction. And people have demonstrated exactly that with polymers, very little friction. Now, what about ice? Uh, what about ice skates? Well, it's been known since Michael Faraday that on top of ice, there's a liquid layer. And you'd say, well, if you have a liquid layer, friction should be reduced. But I think it's more than that. Um, it's possible that this layer that we're talking about contains EZ plus protons, because I just showed you that when ice melts, it gives you EZ. And together with EZ, you have protons. So you have a lot of protons sitting beneath that, that skate. And remember, those protons are repelling each other, so therefore the skate blade is repelled. It keeps away from the ice. And that's why the friction is as low it, as it is. You can imagine also that the more pressure you put on, the more protons you get. So you put pressure, you squeeze out those protons. You put more pressure, you squeeze out more protons. And the more protons you have repelling, the lower the friction. So the ice skater bears down really hard, and the friction goes down. Therefore, you have low friction. Biological implications, the last one. And um, so here's a question for you. How come when you do deep knee bends, you do this with almost no friction? Now, I've got a lot of weight pressing down on my joints. So why is that? Well, if you look at the anatomy, the principle is actually very similar. You have um, a bone here and a bone here, and in between is a so-called joint capsule. And here you have cartilage, which is basically a gel, and here is cartilage, which is basically a gel. So next to the gel, you should have an exclusion zone here, an exclusion zone here, and protons in between. So you expect a lot of protons in between, and you, I just suggested to you what happens when you have the protons, they repel these surfaces. And people who are doing experiments on these joints report incredibly that people bear down, but they don't touch each other. The two surfaces remain some distance apart, and nobody can figure out why. And I'd like to suggest to you that the reason your joints don't squeak is because of those protons that are held in that joint capsule. Now, well, OK, so uh, what happens now when you sprain your ankle? I don't know if you ever noticed, those of you who broke ankles, or <laughs> so if you look at your leg or your elbow, I've been through it, the swelling occurs not in 30 minutes or so, it occurs in 30 seconds or less, 10 seconds. It immediately swells. So how does it immediately swell? Well, I think this has something to do with what we've been talking about. So the tissue that we're talking about in there is either connective tissue, muscle tissue, that's inside er, around those, those joints. Now, if you look, for example, at muscle tissue, so this is, this is um, scanning electron micrograph of a muscle, and the muscle is uh, running uh, lengthwise this way. And you can see, these are mitochondria, by the way, you can see cross connections between these. Now, if you look at the fine structure of these myofibrils, we studied muscle for 30 years, uh, it looks something like this. Uh, here are the protein filaments. And notice something interesting. 
these protein filaments are all cross-connected. They're like rungs of a ladder. So, the situation looks something like this. Now, these are hydrophilic uh, proteins that run this way and they're all cross-connected. Now, when you have a hydrophilic surface, you know what happens. The water layers start building up here. They start building here, the easy layers, and they want to expand the structure. But they can't expand the structure because of these cross-links. And that's why your, your muscles or your tissues don't expand. They have only relatively little water in them. It's only two-thirds water. Other gels are 95 percent water. It's because of these cross-links that don't allow it to, be, to expand. However, if you have an injury and you tear the tissue, what happens is that these cross-links break. And if they break, then these easy layers can pile up with impunity. They just build up. And I'd like to suggest to you that um, without that restraint to swelling, that's what happens when you sprain your ankle or you break your ankle. You get this because the easy layers build up within seconds or minutes. And so the swelling arises from that. Okay, finally, the last three minutes or so. Is that okay? Oh, I, I'm, okay, then I can relax a little bit. <laughs> Thanks. I was, I was hurrying. Um, now I'd like to talk about uh, calories taken in versus the amount of energy that gets used. Uh, see, it's not just the food that we eat, remember, that we get from which we get energy. It's the radiant energy that comes in. We're full of water, right? And I'm receiving radiant energy all the time from outside, from the light here, that light, and, and, and the walls. And, of course, plants use this energy to their advantage. And the question is, can we make use of any of this energy, uh, of this received light energy? If you take your hand and you shine a flashlight in the dark, you can see the light coming through. So, some wavelengths do penetrate pretty far. And the question is whether we make use of that, that energy. And one possibility, a place where we might make use of it, is in the cardiovascular system because the vessels are pretty superficial. Now, obviously, the heart is pumping and generating pressure in our arteries and whatever, but when you get down to the capillaries, you have a bit of a problem. So, the red blood cells look like this and they're typically uh, six or seven micrometers in diameter. People, young people, uh, the capillaries, the smallest vessels, are actually less than six or seven uh, micrometers. Some of them are as small as three or four micrometers. And so, you know, if you're a mechanical engineer, you're not going to design the system this way where you try to take something big and, s and stuff it through. But that's actually what happens. And the question is whether there's enough energy from the heart to actually drive it through. And my Russian colleagues have done some calculations. I'm not sure if they're right. They calculate that if the heart really pumped the blood through those narrow, forced it through those narrow capillaries, the heart would need to develop 10 to the 6 times the pressure that it actually develops because the resistance is so high in those vessels. So the question is whether maybe there's some other energy that helps that. So if you actually look at, at some vessels inside of muscle tissue, you can see that the red cells are distorted. They're bent. They have to squeeze through. They don't just sail right through like that. And some actually are retarded quite a lot in, in their passage. So the question is whether, you know, it might be that that this gets some assist from the energy that's coming in from outside. Now, that would seem ludicrous, a ludicrous idea if I hadn't shown you uh, that we actually see it in the laboratory. We have a hollow tube, uh, a hydrophilic tube, just like the vessels, sitting in water. And um, I've shown you that the radiant energy that comes in is driving the flow through vessels. So, I raise the question, no answer, might radiant energy help drive your blood flow? Uh, uh, might we take the absorbed external radiant energy in assisting with that? So, this is actually more general than just the cardiovascular system, you know, because um, in cells, we have, of course, the cells are much more crowded than I've shown here, but around each protein will be an EZ, negatively charged, and in the water that's beyond that, it'll be positive charge, positively charged. So, you have negative, ch negative charge and positive charge separated from one another. And all the reactions that occur in the cell require either negative charge or positive charge. They're reduction or oxidation reactions. So, you, what you have basically is a ready-made system to drive those reactions. And the energy for that can come from ambient radiant energy or heat energy generated by other regions in, in the body. In fact, 
all those protons that are generated, very similar to some of you who know biology about mitochondrial proton pumps. This is a proton pump and you get it free in a very simple way. So, separated charges drive reactions. So, I think the exclusion zones are central for biological function and just at the last moment I want to mention two things is that if the EZs are central to biological function, now what wipes out biological function at least temporarily? Well, anesthetics do, right? Anesthetics block all nerve conduction and, and many other uh, aspects and we did some experiments. I don't, I'm not going to show you the data but I don't want to keep you too long. And we found that in clinical concentrations, the anesthetics, two local anesthetics, uh, bupivacaine and lidocaine, diminish this zone and, and bring it to zero in clinical concentrations. And in the reverse, aspirin, salicylic acid, which improves function. And so, you know, if you have a headache, it goes away. If you have soreness, it goes away. If you have fever, it goes away. You take aspirin, it's good for you. So we thought, well, you know, maybe aspirin actually increases the exclusion zone and sure enough, that's exactly what we found. Uh, I'm not going to show you the data. It's not, the experiments are ongoing but they, they show it. So, I think that the easy water is central to all biological function which is what I suggested in that book. New book as I said is coming, coming soon. And the last couple of slides, practical use of energy. So, you know, the sort of almost no-brainer is that if you have charge separation, that you ought to be able to capitalize that to get energy and we put electrodes in there and the energy and Kurt Kung, if you want to speak to him, he's here, is working on this project. It looks quite promising to get electrical energy out of this and this is from the sun, energy from the sun using water, a renewable resource. And finally, obtaining drinking water. If you have a hydrophilic material and you put contaminated water next to it, that is water it's got junk in it, the bacteria, the, uh, colloidal particles, whatever. All the stuff gets excluded and the exclusion zone is pretty, pretty big, uh, this EZ. And so if you could collect this EZ water, um, that should be free of contaminants. We don't know for sure but we think that salt might be excluded too. And if salt is excluded, um, then um, it might be possible, we don't know this yet, to take ocean water and get drinking water from the ocean water and this would be using the energy from the sun, not doing reverse osmosis where the energy requirements are, are huge. So the main conclusions, one is that the phases of water. So we know the three phases and it looks as though the EZ phase is um, another phase of water and, and if you take account of the fact that water has not three phases but four phases, then you can begin to understand many phenomena including many everyday phenomena, a very small fraction of which I've been able to talk about. Another point is that a glass of water is not at equilibrium with the environment. It's always, it's a transducer that takes energy in and converts that to other kinds of energy. So, where we've come is um, it was starting with the idea that the water is, is absorbing this kind of energy. Uh, I've suggested to you that uh, this energy may be very important in, in various biological processes. We have no clue yet. Uh, this is just at the beginning to understand that water uh, might, might, or the radiant energy absorbed in water might play a very critical role in all of biology. In chemistry, well if you read the chemistry books, anything that's dissolved in water or suspended in water it's just, you know, it may have one ordered layer of water around it. And if what we presented is right, it means that that paradigm is totally different. It means that basically what's in the chemistry book in aqueous solution or suspension may need radical reinterpretation. In terms of weather, well, you know, weather prediction is mostly based now on temperature and pressure. I think charge is much more important and I think to get better weather uh, predictions, if you take account of the charge in the clouds and the charge in the atmosphere, you have a much better chance to get a better prediction. In terms of health, uh, we were talking with various people about various kinds of water that contain energy and these kinds of water have been demonstrated anecdotally but in some cases more than anecdotally 
to be able to reverse pathologies of various sorts. And I think this is very promising for the future. In terms of food, if you want to store food, prepare it, freeze it, you have to understand what water does, what happens during evaporation or freezing. I think we have a better idea now. I haven't demonstrated in detail, but, but we've demonstrated uh, actually quite nice filtration. You can remove the easy and it's free of contaminants and possibly uh, desalination and getting, uh, getting energy from the water. So I leave you with that and um, I think water has been really exciting to see and I, I think we've discovered some stuff that has some, some potential for the future. Thank you. Thank you.